Mission Transition is a veteran-led project started by Still Serving Veterans, a nonprofit that helps transitioning military members with all things employment as they look for civilian jobs. Oh, and it doesn't cost you a dime. Find out more at ssv.org. Anyway, here's retired Navy Chief. Good morning. As Ethan said, I'm Dave Lakin. I'm the uh, program manager for Veteran Employment Services here at Still Serving Veterans. Today, we're talking to General Thurgood. Uh, General Thurgood, uh, among many other things that we'll talk about through the course of the conversation, uh, has a doctorate in strategic planning and organizational behavior and retired from active duty in 2022. And uh, and we're going to ask him some about uh, some of his postings uh, along the way. Good morning, General Thurgood. Thank you for being here today. Hey, David. Good morning. It's uh, super great to be here and honored to, to reach out and uh, talk to you know, some of our great veterans and our heroes of our nation. So thanks for the invitation this morning. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, you know, sometimes we struggle with uh, with relevance. You know, when we, we talk to some of the senior leaders that we have in the service um, and and trying to figure out how how is their experience at the at the top of the food chain uh, relatable to folks who tend to be our target market, so to speak. Um, being the first and second term enlisted, of course we serve everybody, but that that again is kind of our target. Um, but uh, we will bring it back to that. But uh, just just to start us off, I want to read a quote um, of yours uh, it was from an interview with Amy Tolson of Redstone Rocket from November of 2015, and you said, "I quickly learned that there's more to life." and a greater purpose than the immediate space around us. There's a greater purpose at play across this nation for which we each have a critical role. We must each do our part. We must rise to the occasion and accept the task that is in front of us. Whether our task is on the distant battlefields or in every hometown around this nation, that's where we build America and that's where our strengths come from. And that it gives me goosebumps just to read that. And uh, I really appreciate that you said that. My, my question regarding that is um, now that you are out of the service and you are out of uniform and given that's all, all that's happened since uh, 2015, you know, in our country with exiting Afghanistan and COVID and, and uh, you know, two different uh, presidential administrations, has that mandate changed for you or has it changed for us as a nation and, and how, what do you think about that? Well, thanks, Dave. It's, it's a great question. I, I think at the, uh, the core of that, that quote that you read is really uh, the heart of the passion uh, that I've developed over years serving with my, my father who, who served a full career in the military. So I grew up in a military family and my career just under 38 years. Uh, is the passion for this great thing called America, this great experiment in this republic that we live in. And I, I would tell you that uh, this nation, uh, by, by either birth or by definition, is a sentinel, a leader for our global community. And, and sometimes we do that greatly, and sometimes we struggle to do that. Um, the the clothes that I wear don't change that passion. Whether I had that passion in uniform or whether I have that passion uh, now as retired working, still working with uh, those defense industry partners that serve our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, Marines, our Space Force, those um, passions don't change uh, because I don't put my, my OCPs on every day. And I think our veterans, our great heroes of our nation that served our nation, by the way, less than 1% of our nation raises their hand to, to, to commit to themselves and to our nation, uh, their service, which is really a blank check of whatever the nation needs us to do uh, for, their, for their families and their own lives. Um, that experience and that passion, I think, continues with our great veterans. Um, and I think in that hap in that 
instance, the community they live in have great benefit, uh, whether they realize it or not, our communities have great benefit from our veterans. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, that's kind of the one of the tasks that we work to overcome every day is convincing employers, you know, some, some like the idea of hiring veterans, um, but they, they don't really understand everything that a veteran brings to their work environment and how to capitalize on it. And, um, and of course, you know, we, sometimes we can be a bull in a China shop and, and we, uh, we bring uh, a level of get it done that can be disruptive in a civilian environment sometimes. But, uh, you know, that's, that's part of the struggle is learning to make the best of every employee and how to, um, how, how to uh, tamp down and, and uh, refine uh, the various skills that they bring. Um, yeah. You started off as Enlisted, is that correct? Yeah, I started off, you know, a few years ago as a young enlisted soldier in the infantry. Uh, and I, I really value that experience. Um, I, I believe that a, a, a variety of experiences creates, you know, great leaders and great NCOs and great warrant officers. Uh, you know, I, I, I cherish back to the days of Sergeant Og and Sergeant Clough, who were my, my platoon sergeants of basic training, you know, who left a great impression on my life. Uh, and then later through great NCOs, uh, the Sergeant Henderson, Sergeant Rogers, all those Sergeant Garrity's, those great NCOs, and then the great leaders who who coached uh, and mentored me through my career. And hopefully over the years, I've been able to do that for a few a few others. You, you mentioned the skills that our soldiers have, and I think it's important to recognize a, a few critical things that maybe employers don't really see on any given day. Uh, one thing that soldiers do well, and I'll just, when I say soldiers, I mean all of our service members, um, is that they know how to work in ambiguity. They, they know how to, to adjust in real time to the environment around them. And, and they understand the situational ambiguity and can and can take that ambiguity and, and stay focused on the mission and task at hand. You know, clearly as a as a young uh, enlisted soldier, as a young officer, we're taught uh, the values of the Army. Those haven't changed. Uh, and those are critical things that I think any organization would want in their employees. You know, loyalty, duty, respect, honor, integrity, you know, personal courage, uh, and selfless service, all, all of those core values uh, we want in our communities, we want in our, our, our job locations. And, you know, as you're a young officer, you, you really learn how to think through task orientation thinking, thinking how to do a task that's given to you, you know, run this convoy, run this range, take this hill. Those are all very specific tactical tasks that happen. And, and our young NCOs and our, our young officers are super great at that outcome. And they can think through that outcome. Um, and they know how to systematically make decisions that are appropriate for the situation that they're in. And they've been taught and practiced over and over uh, what we call the military decision-making process. It's not unlike the Kidder model that you see in a business domain or any other you know, decision model and they're good at it uh, as they get more senior in their nco ranks in the warrant officer ranks and the officer ranks they shift their thinking from task orientation thinking to strategic thinking and and they get better and better about creating and connecting ideas and thoughts and strategies uh, for the broader outcome you know at the at the battalion brigade division levels and of course in the corporations at the general management vice president levels in in companies and corporations um i i would say that most of your uh, the perception is as you as you said dave sometimes the perception i think wrongly is that that military you know are are bowls and china cabinets i, I don't really think that's that's accurate. I think it's 
it's more likely that they're situational leaders. They're situational aware. Sometimes you do need to be a bull in the China cabinet. Sometimes you need to be really aggressive, but sometimes you need to be really patient. And sometimes you have, need to be really compassionate. Um, and so I think, I think our, the value, one of the great uh, values of our, our service members is that they're situationally aware and, and can adapt to the situation at hand uh, to help the corporation, help the community uh, move forward. Yeah, I, I, um, I agree with that for sure. Um, some of the decisions that we make are, are based on values, based on orders, based on, on training, uh, based on immediate circumstances. Um, for, for you, um, what were some of the fork in the road events throughout your career progression that kind of guided you to, you know, to, to, to become, you know, Lieutenant General Thurgood and, and uh, get through your many years of service? Well, I would, I would say there's been many, many forks in the road. Uh, luckily, sure. uh, I had some great, uh, I have a great family that helped me make some of those decisions. Uh, my dear, my dear wife of 38 years, um, you know, great leaders, great NCOs that steered me and, and, and helped me through those decision trees that we all go through on our career. You know, but I can promise you there wasn't one time when I was an E3 that I said to myself, you know, Neil, one day you're going to be a three star making offensive hypersonic weapons. <laughs> that, that thought never crossed my mind as a young E3. Um, and so uh, sometimes I think we look at our, our decisions and we, we try to map out our lives and our decision tree for years and years and years. And, and my experience is that if people look at their life truthfully, they have long term goals. But those forks in the road, the decisions you're talking about, they're generally in the 12 to 18 month time frame. <laughs> it, it, that, that's where those decisions that keep future opportunities open, open or close future opportunities. I think it's I think it's very important to have clear long term goals uh, on on big, important things. You know, where do I want to be? You know, when do I want to retire permanently? When do I want to leave the military? If I'm going to leave the military, what kind of profession I want to be in? Uh, what kind of time I want to dedicate to that profession? You know, what are my financial goals? What are my spiritual goals? What are my physical goals? I think those have to be clear and written uh, and and guide our near term decision making. But if I look back truthfully in my life, you know, I, I didn't know the assignments I was going to have you know, maybe a year out from the time I got my next assignment. And so yeah. I, I think if we keep a near term focus, it actually makes the decision process um, a little bit easier for us. Um, sometimes we, we try to verbalize multiple variables for our decisions against our goals. And I think it's pretty easy when you bring that near term uh, perspective on the decision making with the long-term view of where you want to be in the long-term. Um, so I think there's that balance that happens in our, our focus. Sometimes we get a little bit overwhelmed. We see some of our veterans get a little bit overwhelmed with all the decisions in life that have to be made. And, and they actually all don't need to be made at one time. <laughs> they can actually be made in a very deliberate process. Uh, and that can help us have clarity in our thought as we, as we think about the decisions that, that we should make. You know, it's a, a couple of great uh, uh, axioms come to mind. One is you'll be most like the five to seven people that you surround yourself with. And uh, and also uh, John Maxwell said, you know, everybody's either a lifter or a leaner, right? So there's only two kinds of people out there. Um, and so that, that brings me to mentorship. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of uh, – you know, finding finding that good mentor who's going to lift you up, who's going to challenge you, who's going to, you know, um, be a, a good influence on you, uh, and uh, and the importance of being a good mentor and mentorship in uh, in and out of the service. I think mentoring uh, for me has been a passion. Uh, it's actually what I spent a, a fair amount of time when I was working on my doctorate uh, 
uh, studying, mentoring, and, and great mentoring programs in different organizations. You know, the Army, the services have a very deliberate mentoring program inside the chain of command. Um, the, the problem with that is, uh, one of the problems with that is that sometimes in the mentoring in the chain of command is seen as a little bit attributional, right? We, we're scared sometimes to lay everything on the table to our boss <laughs> and, 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 and fear that they may not like the thing that we're doing or the path that we're on. Um, and, and I think we as senior leaders have to, to, to kind of get over that construct. You know, I've told the, the officers that I've mentored and NCOs and warrant officers that I've mentored over the years is my, my job is to give you the options and the risk and the opportunity. My job is not to make your decision for you. <laughs> um, my job is to lay out what I what I see as as perceived outcomes uh, based on who they are and what their skill sets are, and then encourage them to study and make their own decision. Then, then whatever they decide. Whether I personally like it or not, I will help them do that thing. Whether that is to re leave the army, to stay in the army, uh, to do those things. I, I think if you study mentoring, um, mentor mentors that are outside your immediate chain of command are are very helpful in helping you understand the unspoken rules of organizations, um, the unspoken things that happen that are effective in organizations. And who might be the formal leaders and who might be the informal leaders in organizations. Um, I also think mentors at the end of the day are truth tellers, right? They're, they're there to help uh, you sit down and go, hey, this, this perception you have of you, you is you're better than what you think you are, or maybe you need to improve on these things. Uh, so I think truth telling is really important. Uh, for for the mentor in a, in a non-attributional, non-threatening way, uh, and that will help help uh, the young officers or pe people in your organization or your company uh, move you and progress you to those jobs. And it's important to recognize that that people come in and out of our lives, uh, and sometimes they boost us, and sometimes. Um, and they stay for a while and they accelerate our performance and then they, they move on to something else. And sometimes we pass through people's lives and we can accelerate them and then we move on. Um, I think we have this false notion that that mentors, uh, once you have one, they, they're with you forever and ever. <laughs> and and I think we have to change those mentors over time, but depending on, on what we want to do and who we want to be uh, as we progress through our professional careers, uh, through our lives. You know, I don't think mentoring is just a professional thing. I think we have them in our all aspects of our lives. You know, some of those are our friends, some of those are our family members, but they help us see who we are and, and what we can become and, and, and help us on the vision that we want to be uh, in the future. I, I think it's also uh, important that in this mentoring idea, uh, and I'm going to kind of, kind of bridge here to a, a secondary topic. You know, you hear you hear people in corporations and and you hear people in the military say, "Well, you got to maintain balance in your life." And and I've heard that my whole career. Uh, and and I a few years ago, I actually stopped using the term balance. Uh, at, balance implies equality. <laughs> It applies that if I spend 10 hours at work, I need to spend that much time with my family. If I spend 12 hours on vacation, I need to spend that much time in my office. And I, I don't think that's really an accurate description of what we're actually seeking when we use the term balance. I think what we mean uh, and the word I use is harmony. Some if you listen to music being played, um, you know, some notes get played really loud sometimes and some notes get played soft. And then in the next stanza of a song, that note that was soft is now loud and this note is soft. I think there are times in our lives when when we play notes loud that are professional notes. And I think there are times in our life when we play notes loud that are personal notes, that are physical notes, that are financial notes. So I think the idea of harmonizing our lives uh, helps us realize that that the ebb and flow of life is not keeping everything equal. <laughs> 
it's keeping our goals in mind as we as we ebb and flow through different parts of our goals over to, over time. And if we can if we can put our head around that and get our minds around the idea that uh, some jobs uh, in the military, for example, you know, you, when you're in the XO or chief of staff to a four star, you're spending a lot of loud notes on your profession. <laughs> you know, those are long days. Uh, and then sometimes when maybe you're in a different role, you may have a little bit more flexibility to play other notes louder. And I think that's the same in corporations, uh, in the businesses, you know, in, in, and what I see is there, there are, are like last weekend here in our, in our nation, when we watched, you know, what happened in Israel with Iran, uh, we spent a lot of time on the phone over the weekend, making sure that we were ready, prepared, product was ready on all those kind of things to help our soldiers if they were called upon. The weekend before that, I spent the weekend with my family. <laughs> so it, it's, it's the harmony of, and flow of things that you have to uh, recognize uh, as a situation that you're in. Yeah, I, I like that idea of harmony. I, I think of it as congruence, you know, the things going on in our life that are in harmony or in congruence with where we are, maybe in the moment, maybe at this point in your life as you're getting ready to transition out of the service, you are focused on uh, a given set of goals, you know, find a job, find a place to live, you know, figure out, you know, what we're going to do with the kids in school and, and all that stuff. Um, and and so to stop in the midst of that and think about when 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 and where's the next vacations is not congruent with <laughs> with the goals that are immediately at hand. So um, so I, I agree with that. And 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 those cycles uh, are not equal. Sometimes the, the amplitude is is uh is small and sometimes it's great and right. and uh and like you mentioned earlier is our adaptability uh, our ability to um to uh shift as as needed to the situation so i really like that idea of, of harmony rather than balance necessarily um you said once that uh you had a great appreciation for how noble a thing service in the military is and i love that idea of nobility um, my wife's a school teacher, and to me, that is one of the most noble professions to get up every day, uh, at least 185 days a year, and go teach somebody else's kids when you have no ability to discipline and you're highly governed and restricted in, in what you can and can't do. And yet you have to put out this product that, you know, for my wife as a kindergarten and first grade teacher to... Uh, you know, she, she has to put out this product that is ready by all standards for the next school year and, and really for a life ahead, you know, as those formative five, six, seven year old kids um, and and service. Some people take the go to the military because they're forced to very few, actually. Um, some people feel like that's the only direction they had, the only opportunity and others do it truly is a sense of service to their nation. And maybe that's for one term or for, you know, a, a 30, 40 years. Um, but that sense of service uh, is what I, you know, I, after I got out of the military, I, I felt like I didn't have that. What am I serving now? You know, other than feeding my family and going to work every day. Um, that that I, I felt a, a void in that sense of service, and and so I have sunk myself into a lot of community projects and nonprofits and things like that. Um, can you expand on your ideas of the the nobility of service in the military and and how it extends beyond you know their time in uniform? Now, it, thank you, Dave, for that question, and and please tell your wife thank you for teaching. <laughs> teaching our youth of our nation. I have fond memories of, of great teachers, uh, of great coaches, uh, of great folks that influenced me. I, I'll just share with you a quick story. I, uh, my high school English teacher, uh, Vado Horrocks was her name. And, you know, I can't remember one thing that she said to me when I was a senior in high school, but her influence on my life over the years has been dramatic. Uh, I remember her 
example. I remember her integrity. I remember her willingness to help us. And and I, I've referenced her since, since the time I was a young soldier all the way till you know, I retired and I still reference her. And so about a year and a half ago, I, I actually went on a quest to find her. <laughs> I hadn't talked to her since high school. I left the day after graduation, uh, my hometown at the time in Oklahoma, where my father was stationed, haven't been back since. But I've re referenced her so many times in my life. And then finally, um, 40 years later, I tracked her down in Texas where she was retired and I called her <laughs> and I, uh, you know, she oddly enough remembered me and our family and, uh, and we still talk to this day. I just called her to tell her, thank you. I said, look, I was a young high school kid. You had no idea the impact you had on my life and maybe the impact, the broader, broader impact on our nation. So to our, to your, to your teacher, and to all of our teachers and those that that serve our nation uh it's critically important you know this idea of service uh and idea of of something greater than ourselves is uh, a foundational value uh it was a foundational value in our family i remember as a young man at thir 13 standing at checkpoint charlie with my father who at the time was i think a major or lieutenant colonel and looking across the, the balloon wall into east germany distinctly remember thinking to myself we don't want that to be our future those people are not happy and fast forward a few years later uh, only as as young teenage sons can do their fathers on military posts they would play the national anthem before the the movies and so i remember going to the movie in germany with my father and we'd stand up to play the national anthem and I remember he'd get all choked up. And I, I remember saying to my dad, what, what is your deal? Why are you, why is this so emotional for you? Now, fast forward, you know, 30 years later, and I'm that guy. I can't hardly listen to the national anthem without getting choked up when I realized the great yeah. value of this nation and yeah. the sacrifice of so many of our great sons and daughters to this nation. The thing I, I think about service is, um, I don't think you we can confuse uh, our location with our willingness to serve. Whether you're whether you're working at McDonald's, whether you're working as a construction worker, whether you're working as a teacher, all of those have service to our nation and our communities. Everybody has a role to play, and and we all don't need to play the same role. Uh, all those roles are different. And so, so I don't think service is a particular profession. I think service is a mindset. Um, I, I think service is a driver for what, for what we do. You know, when, when, when I was leading our soldiers, especially our, our senior NCOs and, and officers, I would often tell them, it's not enough to come to work every day and do great things. That's what we get paid to do. <laughs> you, you've got to be involved in professional organizations. You've got to be involved in community organizations. Because one day we're going to leave the service. And, and if all your definition of you is dressed, is, is centered around how you're dressed, then, then you probably missed a, a, broader, a broader opportunity. Um, and so like you, I, I, when I left the service, I was already involved in community activities. It, that was an easy thing to continue to do. And I've done more of it. Uh, when I left the service, I, I already was engaged in, in reaching out to our veterans. Um, and so I think this idea of services is, is really important. It, it's linked to this idea that that uh, I learned. I don't remember where I learned it, but you know, in we often think that that the most important place in the battle is on the front line of the battlefield. And and somebody told me this once, and I don't remember who it was, but I believe it with all my heart. Never confuse your importance to the battle with your proximity to the battle. Um, it, it's very important. What we do in our communities, what our veterans can bring to our communities, how they support our nation is important to the fight, wherever it's at. If you're in the defense industry and you're making equipment, that's important to the fight, no matter where you do that at. 
if you're helping the community build educational programs, if you help the community to survive, the community to grow, those are important to the fight. You know, people often ask our, our soldiers and our veterans have asked me over the years, what makes you do the thing you do? What makes the soldier go over the berm? And at the end of the day, it's not baseball at McDonald's <laughs> and apple pie. At the end of the day, it's the love of the person next to you and the love of the idea of your community and home. That's what makes soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines do what they do. Um, it, it is, and as you mentioned, sometimes you come into the military and you don't really know that and you learn that. <laughs> you, sometimes you have to do the action to get the benefit of the action and to grow into the idea of service. Um, you know, it's very important to our nation that we keep an all volunteer force, uh, that we keep an army that wants to be in the army, an, an Air Force, a Marine Corps, a Navy, a Coast Guard, a Space Force that wants to be in that service. And as much as we make fun of each other militarily between the services, you know, the, the great camaraderie and the harassment we give each other, uh, we all recognize that it takes all of the services to be successful on the battlefield. It takes all of the communities to be successful on the battlefield. And it takes all of industry to be successful on the battlefield. So the idea of service uh, is not necessarily in my mind, a, a profession related construct. It's a construct of, am I willing to go and do things beyond just waking up every day to your point, David, just waking up's not enough. We've got to do more than just wake up every day. Yeah. Uh, I'm tempted to leave it just there, uh, to be very honest with you. But I, I have one more question I want to hit, uh, even though I, I have about a page and a half of notes that I still haven't gotten <laughs> through. Uh, but it's been it's been great commentary. Um, so coming out of the service, often service members feel a sense of loss and isolation because they've left all that behind. Now, right? They hanging up the uniforms for the last time can be a a, um, a really weighty thing and um, leaving your leaving your shipmates and, and battle buddies behind and um, you know the, there's a definite um, what do I do now who are my resources now uh, you know particularly you know somebody like me 24 years in, in the service and and having all that community and and those resources behind me and now i got to figure it all out um that loss and isolation uh is really hard for some people um and i'm i'm sure you know at, at your level you have access and and um resources and stuff and it's less less of an issue for you but for those first and second termers who who have decided to get out because, you know, the next tour was going to be a deployment tour. They've got a, a family now that they have to consider and they don't want to leave them behind and whatever their reasons are. Um, how, what is your best advice? You know, be a mentor for a minute. How, how do you feel like those folks, first and second termers, how, what can they do to overcome that sense of loss and isolation? Yeah, that it's a, it's a great, that's a great question, Dave. And I think sometimes even in the smaller communities of our nation, it gets actually even harder for them uh, when they go back to their hometown, and particularly if it's a, a particularly small community, particularly if perhaps they were they have a, a they're combat wounded in, in, a, in a very serious way, um, whether it was a mental a mental uh, you know, TBI or PTSD or whether it was a physical problem. Um, I tell you, I, I'll start with this idea. Uh, the love of the army is not the grand army. <laughs> the love of the army literally is in the unit that you're in. It's the people you serve with that are right next to you. That's where the love of an army happens. And that's where the, the love of leadership happens. And, and when we leave that, we leave that camaraderie. We leave that. We think that love can't be someplace else. And it's simply not true. Um, if you remember the first day you got to your first unit or your second unit or any new unit, that first five or six months was a little bit awkward. 
because you hadn't developed the experience, the hard things together to develop the camaraderie and the love that we have in our units, in our army, and all, all of our services. So, so with that basic construct, you, you have to know that when you go to a new unit, you're you're automatically part of a thing and you're automatically into an organization and you're not alone. And it's the same in when you leave the service. You you may have, have changed your clothes, but the people you know in your units that mentored you, the people that are now retired ahead of you, uh, the community is full of people. You are not alone. Our service members need to know that they are not alone um, when they leave the service. Uh, in the Army, we call that soldier for life. And uh, whether you want to, whatever profession you want to work in, I, I can promise you that there is a veteran in that skill set, in that professional domain. And, and they want exactly what you want, which is to have that feeling again, to know and have a common understanding, a common lexicon, a common bond of love and, and brotherhood and sisterhood of that experience. I work with a lot of veterans and, and sometimes they feel as you indicated that they're out alone in these communities and they're not. And so what you have to do is a couple of things I, I've found to be pretty important. Number one is, is you have to recognize that you have to be proactively engaged in reaching out into the community. <laughs> you, 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 no one's going to call. No, the community is not waiting for you to come home from the war. <laughs> you, you're going to come home and, and they may not even know that you came home. Um, in smaller communities are actually really good at this. At larger communities, it's a little tougher. But reach out and be engaged uh, in the community, in community service, the thing that you're so good at when you're in uniform. It might be in a volunteer at a school. It might be helping in the local fire department, uh, in a volunteer fire department. It might be at a, a local uh, church, uh, a local library. There, there are all kinds of ways to reach out and get out and be engaged in the community. Be engaged in the professional organizations that you were in the uniform. Those professional organizations uh, continue. And, I, and I, I'm, a, I'm a member of a lot of them, and I enjoy all of them um, and keep those relationships. And, the, and that feeling we had when we were together in our service to our nation uh, will continue. Don't be discouraged when the job that you wanted did not get revealed to you. <laughs> there are lots of opportunities and, and, and don't be discouraged because the first 15 or first 20, they didn't, you didn't, they, you didn't walk in and go, well, we've been waiting all night for you to show up. <laughs> that may not be the case. Um, you know, sometimes y y we get a little bit concerned when we don't have immediate success. I'll just use an example. Uh, everybody knows Hussein Bolt, great Olympic runner. Uh, and and he said, I'm always surprised when people who do something for two, three, four or five months, they get discouraged and quit doing anything. And he said, I trained for four years to run nine seconds. <laughs> right. yeah. That's a powerful message. Uh, and sometimes we get a little bit discouraged after a year or six months or whatever, because we're not having immediate success. It's just like anything else in life. Um, if at first you don't succeed, try again. <laughs> you got to keep working at it and, and, and help the community understand what your skills are and what you can do. Um, you may not be able to start at the top of the organization. You may be able to start at the middle of the organization or the bottom of the organization. Um, but be engaged and be active uh, and, and, and use use the community of veterans to help you. And I, I offer anybody, if they want to reach out to me, I will help them. Um, I, I will help them do the thing and look at opportunities and help them uh, with their own choice, whatever that choice might be. Um, because our community and our nations needs people of value. They need people of character. 
They need people with, with integrity uh, to do those things that will build our communities and build our nation. Our nation will continue to be a, a guide for the global community. Uh, whether we like it or not, whether we endorse it or not, it is the role that our nation has played and will continue to play. And that happens not just in uniform, it happens in our communities, in our professions, whatever the profession is. It's all part of this grand, this grand idea of freedom and, and America is at the base of that construct. When, when is your book coming out? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just happy if I can help somebody. <laughs> Well, uh, sir, I really, really appreciate your time this morning. We, we've gone over time, but uh, I've loved listening to you and talking with you. I hope you'll come back and do it again. Uh, I got through about six out of my 15 or so questions that I had for you. Uh, so uh, plenty more to talk about out there. And um, uh, again, I really appreciate you being here. Still serving veterans. We're, we're here for uh, everybody uh, who was in uniform, who's getting out of their uniform, for their families as well. And um, if we can help with that sense of isolation, that sense of meaning, if we can provide some mentorship, help you to find that uh, place in your in your life, whatever, wherever it is in the country, we're able to help you. And um, uh, thank you, sir, for being here again. And um, that's all we get for today. Well, Dave, thanks for what you're doing, uh, not only for our still serving veterans organization, but for our veterans on an individual basis. Thanks to what you're doing in the community. I know still serving veterans give so much to the communities that reaches out so much. So thanks for letting me be here this morning. The great honor and Dave, uh, thanks for what you're doing and please tell, uh, tell your team. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Have a great day. All righty. Thanks for tuning in. Mission Transition, a podcast for veterans. If you have any questions, concerns, comments, or maybe even want to be on the podcast, shoot us an email.